Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Jenny Bell. Hello, Richard. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted that you're there. Um, and your exhibition is Life Forms at the Goulburn Regional Art Gallery, um, and then in a reduced form uh, further down the track at Australian Galleries in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, as we're talking right now, you're sitting there in the Goulburn Regional Art Gallery in your exhibition space. So congratulations on having that up, which it just is. Give us a yes. little bit of a sense as, uh, as, as visitors walk through the door at the Regional Gallery there, what are they going to see when they come into your exhibition? Well, they're getting to get a glimpse of um, almost 40 years of work. It's, it, but that might sound like an awfully big show. It's, it's, it's not. It's been very well pared down by the curator, Anne Sanders. And so you'll see, when you walk in, you'll see a bank, a grid of drawings that were done in the 1980s and 90s. And, you know, sort of it's, it's a very interesting juxtaposition with the later work because you see the relationship between you know the decades and then you'll see where I've gone with that foundation of drawing in mm. those early years in the early years all I could do was draw so there's a real sense of uh, of an evolution uh, through the exhibition from those very early years as you say for over over 40 years but drawing has always been at the foundation of your work why is drawing so important to you uh, well, it's it's so immediate, and you know that finger and the charcoal. Uh, I've almost always drawn with charcoal uh, because somehow it's just the closest way of of getting a line. It's a very different proposition of painting. You are you. My paintings evolve over um, months and sometimes years. My drawings can be done in three seconds, some of them. I mean, perhaps that's an exaggeration, but I work very quickly with drawing. I mean, in these early drawings, everything moves. A, a cow walks away if you don't get it very quickly. <laughs> Attract it just as you've got the right sort of, um, it's gone, they take off, you know, they're plowing the paddock, they're doing something. And so it, it adds a sort of, urgent dimension to the process and that tricks I think the mind into going very deep very quickly it's a very intense experience drawing you know you, you have to bring your whole energy to it with a painting you can sort of you can you can slowly get into a painting <laughs> it gives you a bit more time the more recent works seem to be very strongly colored and and very simplified forms um, yes. How has that evolved from uh, that very quick drawing that you've talked about to the very considered distilled forms? Yeah, well, in a way, there's a real relationship between the drawing and the later work. Now that I'm talking with you now, um, this work behind me was, I was um, asked to participate in a project. It wasn't something I would naturally choose. And it presented me with a puzzle. Uh, I was asked to be part of this regenerative agriculture art sort of collision in a project called Earth Canvas. And it took me completely out of my comfort zone and worried me and excited me in equal kind of measure. And, you know, just over the process of puzzling and worrying and experimenting, I found a language, and it was this uh, very simple forms, high colour, related to the natural world. Um, I found, yeah, it, it wasn't what I saw on the Coglins farm, it's what I knew was there. And I, because I could imagine what was under the earth, I could play with colour in a way I hadn't done since art school. I'd always been wedded to looking and painting or looking and drawing. Suddenly, uh, I could play and I could imagine what colour a microbe might be. And it was an absolutely joyful experience to sort of watch the clash of colours, to try to create a certain energy 
it was you know it was a, it was one of those moments in life when you're thrown a problem and it transforms something in you let's look at that particular work that you are sitting in front of lifeblood and can you talk us through the the elements that are in that work what are we actually looking at well we're looking at um, the sort of forces that that distinguish this particular farm from its neighbour. And those forces are an, a vibrant, alive microorganism system under the soil and their relationship to the atmosphere, the moon, you know, the rhythms of the moon, the magnetic pull of the moon and the power of the sun. And we often blunder our way through the middle, but our job is to enhance that conversation between the atmosphere and the underground forces that are, you know, the root of our survival. It's not a literal work. It's, it's an imagined world, um, but it's based on my experience, my real experience on that farm. Mm. The relationship that, that, that you have with the land uh, and that you have with the land that you work on um, and that mm -hmm. is your farm is clearly very important and very deep. Tell us about your land, your property, and, and a little of its history. Yeah, well, I grew up on a farm, not this farm that I live on. Um, so I went, luckily, very fortunately, I went to art school and I did work on some other farms. And, and then I came back and married my husband, Rod, and we began, you know, he was very keen for me to be involved in the farm. He knew how much I loved it. And so we worked together and suddenly you find there's a movement called regenerative agriculture. And um, we found that, uh, you know, we, we, in our attempt to try to enhance and regenerate our land, um, we sort of, um, you, you sort of regenerate yourself a bit. You, you, you see the world in a slightly different way. And, you know, our lands, our farm is, you know, originally we sort of thought of it as a way to make a living and now we think of it as a way to make life, you know, and to enhance the landscape is our privilege and, you know, to be able to make a living while you're doing that, you're very, very lucky. Going back to some of your um, earlier works, um, works like Gaining Ground, uh, mm -hmm. number 15, and gaining ground number 25 and presumably there were quite a few other works entitled gaining yes, ground in that series. Were. It, yes. it, it, does that literally talk about um the process and the relationship of of building that farm that you've described gaining ground was my coming to observe i i had never heard of the word micro when i did those paintings or regeneration or uh, it, it, that was all in the future, but it was the steps, the building blocks, sitting in the paddock, looking at gates and fences. And my husband is a master fencer and, you know, the tree that was once a tree is now a fence post and, um, you know, the sheep moving in the paddock, you know, it, it all gave me, you know, sort of bird's eye view because I was sitting there for, we usually worked in four-hour stints and I'd sit there and just and not move really and just and so the farm would sort of be there for me. Some of the most recent works uh, of yours um, are much more in that mode of simplified graphic and very strong colours but are focused on particular types of insect life particularly bees and and moths can you tell us mm. something about that that series of, of butter moths and the bees and where the butter moths series began? Well, I'll start with the bees. I was asked by the Carbon Farmers of Australia to make an artwork for their conference, which evolved out of the Earth Canvas project, I think. And I was so delighted that they would even think of having an artist you know, as part of their very practical conference. So I, of course, started thinking, well, how do you sort of put into paint the carbon cycle or some representation of it? 
And, you know, I don't know where artworks really come from, but suddenly the bees sort of flew in. Just, you know, because I, I actually thought it was, I was sort of going to make a number of insects, but they said, no, we just want the bees. They're, they're perfect. So we made a heap of banners and hung them at the conference. And I could be biased, but I honestly thought it changed the atmosphere. There was about 200 farmers in the room and I gave a talk and I was surrounded by the bees. And I thought, I think something, you know, uh, you know, those fairly austere auditoriums, it softened the atmosphere just a little bit, I thought. And, and so uh, that was a delight. So then when I came to be thinking about um, what I would do for this show, that memory was there. And a moth just happened while I was puzzling over all this. You know, how you, you, a moth just suddenly seems to be sort of battling away in the corner out of, out of its right habitat and seems to be seeking attention. And, and so I sat down, you know, for want of thinking, I may as well just draw that moth. I can't seem to, and I wasn't very happy with the drawings. But in drawing it, I thought, well, I could actually make one because I'd got so I had so much fun using the saw and and colour. So I made, and it worked very well. The first one, uh, you know, it sort of almost flew off the table. And so I thought, well, I'll make another one, and um, and that worked really well too. And then, of course, you go through a bit of a lull, and they they're all a bit dead, and nothing flies, and they're just colour and design, and and so. It took a while to get a few more done, but eventually I got a collection of them that, that had that sort of lift in them. And they they sat and were, sat beautifully on the wall here, yeah. You talk about the physical elements, particularly in some of these more recent works and, uh, you know, cutting them out, making the plywood uh, into the shapes that you want and painting it. Um, but in various other works, there are different materials that uh, that you have used. Um, for example, uh, the work Frosty Morning Bahara um, is yeah. found wood, tin, nails, leather. Give me a sense of how you're drawn to materials and how you incorporate them in the works you make. I made that a long time ago. I think it was the 90s. And I, I thought I, I, I've always, you know, you come across an old house site and there's a, some old timber there and it just looks, you know, it's just made for, for doing something with. And I had, I had a little block of land that had a derelict house on it and so I found quite a few little bits of wood that had their own story. And, yeah, so I did. I made quite a few little works like that. And it wasn't a big leap to actually get a piece of wood that didn't have that history, but it took me about, well, 25 years to realise I could actually just get go into the hardware stock and buy a piece of wood and paint it myself. I always thought I had to find them. There are sometimes um, uh, freestanding, what one might almost describe as sculptural works, um, like Tractor Number 2 and uh, Study for a Horse, um, yes. Do you have a a sense of differentiating between works that that do stand alone or that or that go on a wall, or is it really just part of a continuum for you? They're cousins, really. Um, it is a continuum, but sometimes you get stale when you're making a painting, and you and you you get sick of oil paints and and brushes and. You don't seem to be able to do anything fresh with them. And it's a great relief to, you know, literally go into relief, you know, uh, as they, uh, they are three-dimensional works and they work from behind, but they're also essentially pretty flat. I, I, I have done a little bit of clay work and things and I would like to do more, but um, I... There is something about uh, an object sort of positioned against the white wall, whether it's in three dimensions or not, that has always held me. What do you think you want viewers 
perhaps to take away from this exhibition? Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is how very um, hardworking our regional galleries are. To be honest, the Yvette Del Pozzo, Hannah G, the, the rest of the staff here, they, they pack a punch, these regional galleries. They're, they're, you know, rich, vital places for regional communities to um, encourage young people and, um, and, and the whole community to recognise these other dimensions in life. And they do it on a shoestring budget. That's the one message I'd want people to go away with. Um, the other is the vitality that exists all around us, that everything is worthy of attention, that every moment has the potential to be revelatory, even life-changing, um, a love of materials and that each work could only be done with those particular materials, um, a love of place, uh, a love of, you know, a long knowledge of um, a very small slice of Australia has been intensely observed, felt, touched, smelt and revealed over the last 40 years. <laughs> well, that, that sense of really close observation you have shared with us intensely today. So, Jenny Bell, thank you very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it.